San Diego is home to the busiest border crossing in the whole world. The San Ysidro Port of Entry sees more than 100,000 people go through it every single day. Although this movement between the two sides might seem really normal here, immigration is still a really contentious topic across the United States. I'm Aries, and today on Community Connections, we're gonna be talking about immigration and the immigrant experience. This is a series where we talk about social justice issues affecting our community. We learn from experts and see what we can do about these issues. In order to become better advocates for immigrants, we need to gain a better understanding of their experience. This means understanding why people move, the issues they face, and how we can become advocates for immigrants of all kinds. We're also going to take a minute and analyze this from a biblical perspective. There are more than 675,000 immigrants in San Diego, 55% of which are undocumented. This issue is closer to home than some of us may realize. And almost half the kids in San Diego have at least one immigrant parent. Many of us, like myself, have an immigrant parent or grandparent at home. And some in our community are immigrants themselves. But before we get into this topic, we have to first understand the two types of immigrants that have been at the forefront of this debate. Asylum seekers and undocumented people. Asylum seekers go through a formal process in which they're interviewed and investigated. This is done to prove that they've experienced some kind of persecution in their home country. This can include persecution due to race, religion, sexuality, gender, membership in a social group, or other similar categories. And for many of them, this persecution is based on their sexuality or gender identity. 75 countries across the globe still criminalize homosexuality, and 13 of those have death penalties in place for those who break those laws. On the other hand, undocumented people are those who come into the U.S. outside of the legal process, and usually through overstaying their visas. Many people immigrate in this way because there simply aren't legal routes to immigration for most people. And there's also limitations to how many people can take the legal path, usually through limiting the amount of green cards each country can get. What are the issues immigrants face when they get their lives started in the United States? Although people come to this country for opportunity, they often face increased levels of exploitation, abuse, or extremely poor conditions in detention centers for undocumented people who get caught. Many immigrants face exploitation in the workplace, where companies will use their need for employment to take advantage of them. They often get less desirable and more dangerous jobs like farm working, construction, and maintenance. Agriculture can be particularly dangerous due to the constant exposure to dangerous pesticides and heat. Farmworkers die from heat-related illness at a rate 20 times greater than the rest of the U.S. civilian workers. Those who don't speak English well are even more susceptible to abuse in the workplace. Immigrants are also often the first to lose their jobs in times of crisis, like right now during the pandemic. Another issue is that undocumented women and children often face higher rates of domestic abuse and have less resources to deal with it. Research amongst undocumented women in Houston showed that they feared contacting authorities to intervene in abuse as they connect those institutions to possibly being deported. Lastly, undocumented people face extremely harsh conditions in detention centers if caught. These detention centers often have little to no regulation and have almost no accountability in place. There's no guarantee that they'll receive medical treatment, mental health care, religious services, transfers, access to phones, legal services, or even a library. The ACLU found that most detainees never received any kind of legal representation which makes it even harder to win immigration cases. Today we'll be talking with Judith, an immigrant herself who's gonna be sharing her story with us. Uh, my pronouns are she. I'm a student studying real estate, my real estate license. I think my main thing is I'm a, I'm a sister to uh, my three-year-old, being a granddaughter too, to my grandparents who raised me. My grandparents are from Oaxaca, Mexico, very south. Uh, they moved over to TJ and my grandpa, he was a farm worker and 
and that's how he got like his residency back in the day to be over here and eventually was able to um, get my grandma her papers my aunt and my uncles as well my grandparents they speak a dialect it's mixteco which is which is originary from Oaxaca Mexico they're not fluent in Spanish even my grandma speaks very little Spanish because when I was little my grandma would like they, she'd try to speak to me in, in mixteco and I'd be like I, I don't understand you and of course I'm a student I was here for a year back in 2006 uh, for like first grade of elementary school well I went back to be with my mom over there in TJ after that I came back in 2013 and I've been here ever since I crossed back and forth to go see my mom and my sister when she was born later on I, I only get to see her every so often when I have to cross over and it's it's sad not being able to grow up with her even though it's not like a large distance it takes a lot more effort to go see my mom and my sister there's traffic there's um again that like split and then crossing back there's a lot of line so it takes a lot more more time more effort to be able to go over there my mom just tells her oh she has to go to work she has to go to school but i don't think she understands yet like the fact that there's like a border and then i'm going to like a whole different country like to her i'm just i'm just leaving for work you know what were your hopes hopes for like being here i think school was a was the main thing because i there's just a lot more opportunity with college or just beyond high school growing up my mom my mom had like that big hope for me to actually go to college and get a good career and seek some opportunities that maybe i wasn't gonna be able to find over there just because there aren't a lot of like resources and a lot of like help when you're like a low-income family that you do have here when you're a low-income family here i think just the mentality that you have when you're low income come you're like really seeking those opportunities to grow a lot to be better and seek those opportunities that your family didn't have being low income just just kind of really pushes you first time i went to school here and um i went to middle school and we had a, a uniform so that was nice because i didn't have like a lot of the clothes that other kids had growing up i always shopped at the sobreruedas which are these little like flea market it's just like used clothes and stuff i remember we had to wear black shoes for our uniform and my grandparents got me sketchers and i was like super happy with that i was like okay like new shoes yay i noticed that everyone had like vans and converse this one kid he pointed out like the fact that i had sketchers and he like you know straight up made fun of it i was 13 so i took it like a little bit harshly and i felt it kind of made me feel a little bit less which that was harsh yeah i think my greatest challenges have been having like my family separated it does kind of take an emotional toll on you because i mostly grew up with my mama and just like not having that person like near me when i need her has been hard. My greatest joy has been like getting through high school and being able to experience college to even like now I feel like I'm doing something with my life. I really enjoy just going to school and learning. I do enjoy working. I know not everyone does but I really do enjoy work. I like being productive, kind of feeling like I'm part of something. Um, I know it sounds like a little bit maybe like cliche or something but I really do see myself with like a nice backyard and a lot of dogs, cats, and snakes and you know having enough to pay my bills and my food. <laughs> That's all I want. There was a lot of emotions um, seen, not just what Trump was doing, but what Trump was doing to people. A lot of people felt like they had a little bit more liberty to to be hateful towards people like me, pe people my skin color and darker skin colors. You know, they had like that like security that it was okay to hate us, which was scary. You know, when we when we're like watching the news and they're like, oh, like why would you put your kid? through you know that when it's when it's about like people crossing through the rivers and going through the desert to get here i don't think they understand that in a lot of countries there's a lot of violence and it's kind of like a thing um of you either put your life at risk by staying there or you put your life at risk by crossing over there seeking a better chance i think that's something people get wrong a lot um about immigration a lot you don't really have a choice you want your kids to be okay so you're willing to do what it takes and sometimes what it takes is crossing a river um going through like days of cold and heat to get your kids to somewhere where they can have an opportunity what expectations does god have for us in dealing with these issues in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34, our responsibility is laid out clearly to us. It says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. 
The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. How well have we done in acting on that? I would say our actions towards immigrants in this current day have gone directly against that and go directly against our Christian morals. We've mistreated immigrants in the most unthinkable ways, especially when we look at the inhumane ways that they're treated in detention centers. And to me, this verse is especially relevant because the majority of Americans were immigrants here at one point too. I think we can all take something from this. We need to trust and believe in God's message. We need to do more than just hear this though. We have to treat people the way he's expecting us to treat them. So I challenge all of you to try and change your perspective on immigration. The truth is that many immigrants would love to go through the legal process for coming to the United States. The problem is that the legal process can be incredibly difficult to navigate. It has been intentionally slowed down during the Trump administration and is increasingly ineffective in helping those who need it. To make life better for immigrants, we need to make this process easier. We have to remember that immigrants are humans like us. They have dreams, they have aspirations, they have goals for where they wanna be. If we were experiencing half the things that they have, we'd probably do the same thing. Affording immigrants with opportunities and resources is something we should be doing. Providing DACA to undocumented youth has increased their average hourly wage by 86% and gave 79% of recipients the ability to be financially independent. Making the process easier doesn't mean we get rid of interviews or background checks or anything like that. It means that we staff these services with enough people to make it run speedily. It means that we provide resources to undocumented people who are detained to fight to stay in America lawfully. It means that we make more ways available for people to start their lives in America legally. And although there's no straightforward solution, we can start addressing this issue by spreading our knowledge about the actual experiences of immigrants and correcting those who spread false narratives. And there's a lot of ways that we can help immigrants directly especially as San Diegans who are so close to this issue. Supporting the California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance, Filipino Migrant Center, or the Christ Ministry Center's Refugee Safe Harbor are great ways to directly support immigrant communities. California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance has direct ways to support individuals, such as calls to action, where they provide a script for you to call on behalf of individual detainees who are being unfairly treated. And the Filipino Migrant Center is currently looking for volunteers to help do surveys in San Diego so they can understand the needs of the Filipino community here. They actively work in providing resources to the Filipino community. And the Refugee Safe Harbor at the Christ Ministry Center is always taking donations in order to support the needs of immigrants there. So let's actually do what God's been telling us to do. We need to have empathy in dealing with immigrant issues and let's treat immigrants with love. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. If you don't wanna miss the rest of this series, make sure you hit the notification bell too. See you next time.